welcome. Well, welcome, everybody. It's uh, May 6th. Here at Pittsburgh, we've gone straight from winter to summer. Uh, here in Pittsburgh, we're also a triple threat town. We have pirates, Steelers, and penguins. Penguins in full full bloom here in uh, the spring. I'm Sven Hosford, your managing editor for the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Uh, it's great to see you again and be seen. And uh, we're going to have a really exciting hour uh, coming up this hour. We've got Greg Nicosia, who is one of the founding fathers of energy medicine. We're going to talk about... Uh, EEG, biofeedback, neurofeedback, all kinds of feedback. You can give us your feedback. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the uh, uh, why energy medicine and some of these technologies are the Rodney Dangerfield of medicine. They just don't go no respect. And then we're going to have a little bit of a recap from last weekend's conference. Uh, it was an amazing conference with uh, Louis Melmadrona, Temple Lama, Ted Sibic, Dan Wagner, and all sorts of interesting people. Uh, we'll have a little video update from that, and then we'll get into a conversation uh, with Caroline Shannon Karasik. Uh, try to say that three times fast. Uh, and it, her book is The Gluten-Free Revolution, and it's uh, really a great, uh, great book uh, full of recipes and yoga and Pilates and some wonderful tips and strategies on how to live the gluten-free lifestyle. And we'll be talking about hidden glutens and hidden symptoms of your gluten intolerance. So today is May 6th, as we said. We're here every Tuesday at 4 o'clock at the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. You can also catch us uh, live at Sorgatron Media, live.sorgatronmedia.com. And uh, we post all of our good stuff on Facebook at the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, first thing we like to do here is to go through the calendar of upcoming events. Uh, we've got a really action-packed May. We thought last weekend was action-packed. This, uh, this next couple of weeks, is a lot of interesting things coming up. On May 10th at Sunnybridge, you get to meet our first guest, Caroline, at a smoothie tasting and book signing. Uh, that's May 10th at Sunnybridge. We'll have all the details up on the journal. And uh, then on the 17th, I may have the date wrong on that. I think it's actually the... Um, well, whatever date is, we'll make sure it's right, is the Freedom of Choice, uh, what does that say, Mike? The 15th, okay. The 15th, uh, Dr. Boyd Haley will be coming in. He is an expert on mercury toxicity. He has testified before numerous government agencies, and that's at the Freedom of Choice meeting on the 15th, and that's now being held um, over in Oakmont. It's a really nice place that they're meeting there. And then uh, a busy weekend on the 17th and 18th, we have the Farm and Garden Food Fest at uh, the McGinnis Sisters. Two days of action-packed uh, talks and uh, book signings and samples. Uh, I'll be there, and uh, I know some really interesting people are going to be there. And then also that same weekend is the grand opening, uh, reopening, I guess, well, opening the first time at, under this name of the Four Directions. And uh, this is a weekend-long exhibit of demonstrations and presentations, live musical acts, fundraising, another action-packed uh, adventure there at the Four Directions in Gibsonia. It's an artist and healing uh, location. It's a good place for retreats and uh, many, many interesting things are going to happen there. So check out our calendar for all the details on that. Wow, after all that, I need to take a, take a sip here of this nice green tea that we have at the Sorgatron Media Studios. Let's get to our first guest, uh, Dr. Greg Nicosia. Uh, I call you one of the founding fathers of energy medicine. Would that be Would that be fair to say? Well, in a way, it is. In a way, it's similar. Energy medicine and energy psychology uh, are, from my way of thinking, synonymous with each other because the arbitrary distinction between mind and body causes us to differentiate between the two of them. Technically, if you want to say uh, I was the founding father of something, it would be of uh, energy psychology True. Uh, and not energy medicine because I am a psychologist and uh, technically don't practice medicine. <laughs> but it's all one and the same concept. And, and also that's only our modern understanding of these uh, techniques and modalities, which actually go back you know, thousands and thousands of years, most of them. So it's, you're more like the Christopher Columbus, only you've just rediscovered something, you know, for all of us um, in North America that some other people have discovered long ago. Yeah. 
But uh, you, you brought up a really interesting point uh, that we wanted to talk about today, and that is that there's uh, a kind of a link between energy medicine and uh, the EEG biofeedback. I'm sorry, I got it wrong again. Is it EEG neurofeedback, EEG biofeedback? What's, what's the best terminology we're going to use here? They're both interchangeable. Uh, you okay. know, one of them is more West Coast, and that's neurofeedback. And the other one is more uh, East Coast, which you would call EEG biofeedback, <laughs> or technically it's the instrumental conditioning of the autonomic nervous system. Well, basically, it's a way to read the emotions and the energy field. Is that fair to say? Or what is exactly does it read? Well, what that reads is the electroencephalogram, but it doesn't do it just as a little squiggly line on a chart, the way that you would get it at a doctor's office or hospital. It actually, uh, we read EEG by frequencies and the amount of power in each frequency or band of frequencies in a real-time situation. So that we've got a, uh, a map of what's happening electrically in the brain. And that, that does read some to the emotions and the energy field. I mean, there's a lot of crossover and correlation there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And what, uh, tell us, uh, you, you, uh, what kind of things has it been best shown to treat? Okay. Well, EEG biofeedback is a wonderful technology for people who have any kind of cognitive dysfunction. Uh, so, you know, we treat people who have been uh, seriously injured, post-concussive disorders, uh, post-stroke, for example, to regain their cognitive abilities, their memory functions. We can treat uh, people with ADD or ADHD. Um, you can treat things like depression. You can treat a wide variety of uh, both cognitive and emotional problems. You can also uh, treat things to enable peak performance. You can also train things on the positive side to uh, engender uh, alpha states or theta states where you gain great insight so that people can learn how to have very coherent brain activity uh, with this if they're interested on the positive side of facilitating uh, really good health or uh, different kinds of, let's say, unusual states of consciousness. Take us through a session. Like, how does a session typically work? You get hooked up to a machine, and then what? Do you, what typically happens? Right. Neurofeedback is usually done here in the context of a, a, a therapy, but the actual neurofeedback part of it uh, is where you get wired uh, to a device that is transmitted. Uh, by radio frequencies to a computer. And that computer then is going to show you in real time what's going on inside of your brain. And we've already at that point done a uh, montage analysis of what's going on and, and made a decision that says something like for a typical ADD or ADHD person, they might have a, a great deal of power in the theta wave, four to eight cycles second above sleep but not too much think about it as a daydream like state if you're daydreaming you're dominated by this theta wave band and at the same time if you got the attentional problems you're looking at the usual normal waking thinking frequencies called beta uh, and you might have a very low power relative to what's going on in that theta wave state so fundamentally your brain is walking around you know state that's mostly daydreaming. You're half daydreaming, two-thirds daydreaming, one-third in the normal waking state, sort of shifting back and forth between these things. And that's what you experience in reality or your reality through that filter of uh, daydreaming. And so to the outside world, it looks like you're not paying attention because your mind keeps drifting off in this daydream-like state. And, you know, uh, what we would do is to then simultaneously uh, reinforce decreasing the excess energy, which is microvoltage power in that theta daydream state, decreasing that at the same time, learning to increase the normal waking thinking frequencies, theta power, and make your brain function more like a 
normal brain. And in this way, you learn to do that, and the brain really likes it. And once you've got it, it keeps it. Wow, that's fascinating. So it's like uh, almost like training wheels for your brain. So you get it gives you like a, a, a sense of what it's like to, to think in this newfound state, and then you learn to do it on your own. That's right. And we simultaneously do the kinds of uh, brain games that are used for helping people in cognitive rehabilitation. We have the ability to simultaneously do both of those functions. And the, the brain train technology that we use is really uh, unique in that way. It sounds a little bit science fiction-y, almost. And I think there have been at least one or two, Mike is more the expert on this stuff, but there's probably been one or two of these movies where this kind of technology takes over the world or attempts to. Uh, is that part of the reason why it's not getting the respect it deserves in the medical community? Well, I'm not sure exactly why it doesn't get the respect it deserves. Uh, you know, I think that it has a lot to do with the uh, what's fashionable in society today. That is, people in general are looking for a instant cure. Let me take a pill and make it better. So, for example, you know, parents hear from teachers that the child has ADHD. Most of them really aren't even truly tested for ADHD. It's just a paper and pencil kind of an analysis that's done. The kid's labeled as that. And then they take them to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician says, oh, okay, the kid's got ADHD. Let's try him on selects, uh, you know, one of the uh, popular drugs that's going to be used for the treatment of attentional disorder or hyperactivity disorder, Concerta. Uh, you know, there's Adderall, there's a whole bunch of them. And then that's supposedly the solution. Well, at best, if you're fortunate, it helps the symptoms. It doesn't really treat or help to cure the problem. The cure is available, but it's not an instant cure. So it's going to take, you know, 30, 40, 50 sessions to help somebody with an attentional disorder really correct the way that their brain functions so that their brain can, in fact, attend without the use of any medication. What happens usually is I see people uh, who are either adults uh, in college who, you know, have attentional disorders and, and never got treated or have uh, children who have been on medications for years, maybe their growth has been impaired and stunted, uh, or they reacted poorly to the medications, and then they're coming in and saying, you know, look, this isn't working for us, or it helped in the beginning, but it's not helping now. What can we do? And, and EEG biofeedback is a solution to this problem, but it's not an easy fix. It's not a five minute or, you know, the pill fairy solution, but you're going to invest time and energy uh, and repetition to be able to retrain your brain in this way that can last a lifetime. Now, that all being said, you, there is good clinical research, double-blind studies, all that scientific stuff that uh, the, the supposed people that follow the research like? Yeah, I mean, th there's good evidence. There are things like with functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging that invest neuro investigate neurofeedback and the neural basis of selective attention for the ADHD kinds of problems. There's... Uh, a great deal of literature that's available, but at the same time, uh, even though there's not good evidence for the efficacy of neurofeedback, so here's another article, is neurofeedback an efficacious treatment for ADD, a randomized controlled clinical trials in the Journal of Child Psycholog Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, these are all published in reputable journals, um, but by the same token, there's uh, not big university and uh, large scale with you know hundreds of, of people who are using neurofeedback. So all of this is being done really without government money, and I think that's uh, the kind of impetus that the field needs. It needs some major, heavily funded grants. You know, you're talking half a million, a million dollars to be able to do the kind of research that will really get the attention of the medical community. Uh, you know, if we can show, for example, that overall of a person's lifetime, how much money is going to be saved on medication, 
other treatments, complications that derive from the medications that they take. If you could show the dollars and cents of it to the industry, that's another way to grab the attention. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that probably one of the reasons there's not a lot of research money right now is it doesn't look to the standard model of medicine how they can make a lot of money. You Probably these treatments are a fraction of what it costs to treat somebody with some of these drugs. Yeah, over the long haul, but that's, you know, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that, again, that's short-term thinking. There's no quick way to make as much money as they can by prescribing uh, medicines. So I could see where that would be the case. So um, you had made a, an interesting connection that this, uh, these types of neurofeedback machines and, and uh, uh, treatments, they suffer from the same kind of indignity that energy medicine has, which is that they just don't get no respect. You know, like this is, these are the Rodney Dangerfields here of uh, modern medicine. Um, there's good clinical evidence at more every day, it seems like, on the energy medicine and energy psychology side. Can you take us through the last uh, 12 months or so on some of the research? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, when you talk about energy medicine, actually, and you look at... Uh, therapeutic touch, which has been around with the nurses for many years, there's a, an enormous amount of hospital-based research that these nurses have done on a wide variety of conditions. There's even a code in medicine for energy field disruption for which the uh, therapeutic touch is the prescribed treatment. So you can, you know, have this kind of thing done, but virtually no one knows about it. Um, so, you know, post-surgically, for example, you could request that you have a nurse who, to do therapeutic touch and, and for energy field disruption. Uh, when you come to energy psychology, that branch of research has been growing in the last, uh, well, particularly in the last five or six years. Uh, and there are studies today that show uh, changes in cortisol levels of people with PTSD who are treated by energy psychology methods. And uh, there's one in the effects of uh, emotional freedom technique on stress biochemistry, a randomized controlled study with uh, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disorders in 2011 that got published by uh, Church and others. And there are controlled comparison recently of uh, EFT, which is one of the energy psychology techniques, the emotional freedom technique, when compared to EMDR that was done uh, in, uh, again, in 2011, was published in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease. Uh, so those are, are two studies that show the efficacy of the emotional freedom technique compared to something like EMDR, which has hundreds and hundreds of studies. Yeah. Uh, it, it compares very favorably to EMDR, both of which uh, technologies or techniques, I think, are very valuable to the clinician. And, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but to those who aren't uh, familiar with it, these are techniques which have uh, basically zero side effects, are simple to do, are easy to teach so people can do them on their own besides just having to come to somebody for them yeah. and have shown to have great, uh, probably in the case of EMDR, the best efficacy in the, in the treatment of uh, post-traumatic stress. Is that? Yeah, they really are. The, the energy psychology techniques are wonderful, especially because uh, after a person has been treated professionally, the professional can assign homework that can be done by the individual when they need it. So I can't uh, tell you the number of people I've treated for anxiety or panic disorders, uh, well over 100, probably over 200, who have been able to use these energy psychology, often called tapping techniques, at home so that they can avoid having panic attacks. And they'll come back and say, you know, this is really wonderful because it works so quickly. I don't have to wait for 45 minutes for a Xanax to kick in. Yeah. I don't have to build up those kinds of dependencies. And, and, uh, and overall, in psychology, one of the best things you can do to help anyone is to increase, increase their perceived control in their life 
So not only does this increase perceived control, but it increases their actual control over what's going on in their life and uh, gives them an ability to quell anxiety very quickly or to help with some of the symptoms, the flashbacks of PTSD or the nightmares and things of this nature. So it's really exciting to have a, a technology that not only works and works well and works rapidly, but that the person can learn to use for themselves and really be treating themselves and getting the benefit of treatment on an everyday basis rather than just once or twice a week when they come to therapy. I, I wonder if, uh, uh, no, it's a, you've said that the, these have been shown to lower cortisol levels, all these different kinds of uh, treatments and modalities. Yeah. And you know, lowering of cortisol levels, you know, all the literature, all the studies have shown that stress is a major cause of so much of our illness, high blood pressure, heart disease, all these kinds of things. Uh, and yet, in the modern medical system, the people who are under the most stress are the doctors. And they, do you think they kind of tend to look at other people's life and say, well, oh, your stress level is nothing like mine, and look how I'm dealing with it. And they kind of poo-poo the whole idea of lowering cortisol levels. Is, do you think that's part of why they don't respect the, this, the scientific research in this area? Well, I, you know, I really don't think that's the case, to be quite honest with you. I, I know a, a lot of physicians uh, of, you know, all ages. Uh, and I do think that they're under stress for different reasons, but primarily for performance reasons. Uh, many of the older doctors who would be of uh, my era don't feel like they can practice medicine the way that they were taught. There's just not enough time to get back and talk to their patients and so forth and so on. And that's very stressful for them. It's, it causes them abnormally long hours. Younger docs are under stress. Uh, being a physician is a stressful situation, but I don't think that they look at their stress level and compare other people's. I think it's that they just don't look at uh, the literature. Basically, you know, docs learn what they learn, and then they're pretty much full-time going at it just in practice and don't have a great deal of time to sort of peruse literature. They do take continuing education like other doctors and psychologists and so forth. Uh, but that's probably more or less limited to their specialty. Maybe it's in emergency medicine, for example, or maybe it's in uh, pediatrics or whatever. And, and so the literature that's out there, especially in other fields, really isn't something that is reaching the individual doc. And if they do see things about research, it's often the stuff that uh, pharmaceutical companies are leaving at their doorstep yeah. and saying, here, doc, here's what we found. And and, you know, here's the new medication that you might be able to use to help your patients. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that they're seeing research that they see. Yeah, and that kind of brings us to our next topic, which is uh, if they were to be so bold and to actually go onto the Internet and do their own research, which might start with just looking it up on Wikipedia, uh, they would come up, uh, they searched up energy medicine, I think uh, Mike is going to show us here. Yeah, they, you, you see this uh, article, which is just the most, oh, I don't know, s skeptical doesn't even quite cover it. It's the most um, searing, I, I don't know, it just, it just sneers at energy medicine. And uh, what was the quote uh, the, the founder of Wikipedia recently said, Greg, about uh, people that practice energy medicine? Oh, I don't, I'm not sure which one we're talking about. I, I've tended to forget them. That oh. <laughs> I think it was uh, something like fraudulent lunatics or. Yeah, it, was, it was pretty demeaning. And, you know, the odd thing is that uh, the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology has been trying to use the change uh, structures in Wikipedia uh, to get Wikipedia to update its information to include the research that's current, the research that's available. And you know what we get is that energy psychology, actually I don't think even appears in Wikipedia, and yeah. energy medicine is, is basically looked at as quackery and right. these, witchcraft. Like site are, you know, decades old and they give they give no voice to looking at the information that's been submitted to them to say, hey, you know, here's well over fifty 
uh, published studies that show the efficacy of this newer technology. Uh, so, you know, if the public or, uh, you know, a doc might look at Wikipedia for, hey, you know, what's this stuff about? What they're going to find out is it makes it look as if energy psychology or energy medicine really doesn't work. Really, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's reported that there's no real good evidence for it and that anybody practicing it is basically some kind of a quack. And that, that's so far from the truth today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you and I both know the, the, the overwhelming amount of evidence. Uh, we both had our personal experiences. You've had a 9-11 survivor who've actually, you've treated and is now living a normal life after having quite a, a, a terrible time for a number of years. Absolutely. We know this is all true, uh, and yet we've, we've still faced this kind of, uh, it, I don't know, what's, what's the, what do you think the root cause of it is? Well, change comes at a very slow pace. People who have power and control are reluctant to relinquish it or have it change and, and go out of their control. I mean, that's something that I've seen over the years, so that's not strange. You know, by the same token, uh, you know, I do work for uh, a number of law enforcement agencies and departments. And, you know, when PTSD problems arise, uh, you know, I'm often the go-to guy because they know that I can get a good result in a relatively short period of time with some kinds of problems that if they're not treated successfully with things like EMDR or um, thought field therapy or some of the energy psychology things uh, may last a lifetime and, and have caused many people to go on uh, retirement or disability retirement pensions uh, for the rest of their lives. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I've seen this thing for many, many years. And, uh, you know, the most uh, recent things we'll see in news, people will end up on my doorstep uh, sooner or later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, God bless you for all the work you're doing. Uh, you're fighting the good fight. And uh, I think the good news is that more and more doctors are getting it and they are coming around. Um, s most of the time, it's usually their own crisis of one sort or another. It's usually our own health crisis that drives us into uh, what we're doing, it seems like. Uh, but I do see a lot of physicians, believe it or not. And uh, the interesting thing is that once they experience the the power of these things, it's like, wow, you know, why don't we know anything about well, this? Where have you been all my life? <laughs> yeah. But uh, if you are interested, anybody out there, go to the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology's website, which is energypsych.org. Energypsych.org, okay. And you can access uh, research. You can access lots of information. Uh, there's videos on a number of subjects and t tells you about uh, what's available for education. And uh, I think you'll enjoy the fact that you're there. Yeah. And you've got a uh, conference coming up on uh, uh, yep. in, uh, what is it, uh, in early June, is it? End of May, early June. End of May, right. early June. With all the top shelf uh, healers I saw, Donna Eden's going to be there. Uh, she's just one of the best. Feinstein, yeah, she's actually, when you talk about energy medicine, yeah. uh, Eden is definitely one of the people who's made it happen. Well, she literally wrote the book, so it's always fun <laughs> to be in her presence. Absolutely. She's a joy. Well, Greg, thank you so much for being with us today. I um, uh, always enjoy talking to you, and uh, we'll uh, catch up with you again real soon. Thanks. I hope to see you again soon. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. You bet. Take care. And uh, coming up, we'll be talking with gluten-free expert Caroline Shannon Karasik. And uh, we'll be getting, uh, first up, let's take a look at some of the reactions to last weekend's energy conference here. It was the uh, Lifestyle Medicine Conference, uh, May 2nd, with the keynote speaker, Louis Madrona. Let's take a look at that. The first Lifestyle Medicine Conference in Western Pennsylvania was a community effort led by medical director, Dr. Safdar Chaudhry, of St. Clair Behavioral Health in Export, PA. Many of the most successful and well-known integrative medicine physicians and other professionals came to hear keynote speaker Dr. Louis Mel Madrona. He spoke on the intersection of science and spirituality. And being a conference about lifestyle choices, some people chose to dance. 
exciting to have all these people interested. A lot of really great topics. Dr. Shabby's great at bringing people together. That's a particular skill of his. Uh, and I was very proud to be part of it. It was probably the funnest conference I've ever been to. And the vegan food was excellent yes. and um, opened our eyes to right. many things. Um, Dr. Shabby's put together a great conference to bring together the integrated minds. I think it was absolutely awesome and I hope we do this again because I think a lot of people don't realize what they missed if they weren't here. And I think a lot of people that were here are looking forward to the next conference. Yeah. I think it went very well. It was so nice to have so many people from all different modalities here. Um, I think Dr. Chaudhry is really getting the energy going with holistic medicine and we just have to keep meeting and spreading the word and it's a long time coming but it's time. Yeah. Well, I was really glad I came. You know, all the speakers were quite excellent and I think they all had a good message to say about you know, the energy and the frequency and the chi. It all came together and of course the group was very open to that and it was a great group you know and um, so I'm certainly glad I came and I think I'd to thank Dr. Chandri for his vision of putting this together. We hope there's more. A lot of fun, I love the movement and the dance and the flow of great speakers yeah. to teach us uh, from our own backyard. Yeah. It's almost like going to the organic market and uh, getting juice, yeah. which is our own local talent and uh, that the juice and allows us to become more uh, engaged in the knowledge that we are still learning. So I, I was absolutely thrilled to hear all the speakers see people interested in the subject matter. So it was the first organic mental health conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had several people say, can't wait till next year. So yeah. what, what are we going to do next year to top this? Yeah, next year I'm going to be moving to Arizona. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can all go hang. <laughs> well, we set the intention. We'll set the intention. Yeah, set all the right. intention and let the, let the mystery unfold. Okay. So we are hoping that we will build upon this year's experience and, and the knowledge to bring it uh, with a new vigor yeah. with, uh, with more people and enhance the circle of friendship. What, else, what other kinds of things do you see moving forward that uh, the doctors and the professionals are doing together? Well, I think there's a very early awareness of the fact that the doctors are burned out. Mm. Uh, I mean, I had these conversations with many of the clinicians who were attending today. Yeah. And so I'm hoping to uh, address some of the healthcare burnout, uh, but also offering opportunities in maybe in smaller workshops uh, uh, in between the bigger conference as well, so that we have smaller workshops which are more uh, intimate, more engaging, and also very really hands-on too. We'll see. Great. Life is beautiful. Thank you. So we're back uh, here on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. This is the uh, second half of our show. And uh, I can't uh, say, first off, again, what a great time we had last weekend at the conference. Um, and that was a conference on Friday. And then a retreat with Lewis on Saturday at St. Clair, which was phenomenal. Lewis is just uh, such an amazing character. And then uh, on Sunday, Jacob Lieberman was in town. It's, it was such an uplifting experience just to be in his presence. Uh, be sure to watch the, the videos if you, if you missed him. Uh, we have some video uh, interviews with him here on the Journal uh, website. But next up, we've got Caroline Shannon Karasik. Am I saying that right, uh, Caroline? You are. You nailed it. I, got it. I nailed it the first try. You know, it's, uh, it's a rarity for me that I can get people's names. Uh, you're the author of The Gluten-Free Revolution and the blog uh, Sincerely Caroline. And uh, I, I'm fascinated. Uh, tell the story of how your blog turned into a book. This is every author's dream, I think, right here. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so long story short, I was diagnosed with celiac disease three and a half years ago, and I'm first a writer. So I started my blog just to kind of document all of my successes and failures along the way and help other people learn from my experiences. Um, so I started my blog, and fast forward to last February, I put out a free ebook for my readers just to kind of provide them with some other resource. And um, I had a publisher, an editor, contact me that works for a publisher in New York City and asked me if I was interested in making it into the big thing, the big book. Um, so uh, I said yes, yeah. <laughs> and um, wrote the book. and just this past January it came out and it's been it's been a whirlwind of excitement and you know some of my favorite parts now are getting to meet the people that I for so long have connected with through social media or with my blog and um, it's been a really cool experience so that's awesome and yeah. I, I love the book I mean it's just uh, yeah. great recipes great photography uh, and then I love too that you've included the uh, movement you know, about a third of the book seems to be yoga and Pilates. Yeah. Yeah, that was really important to me because um, I wanted people, I always say, you know, that gluten-free is just one thing of this life, this big, beautiful lifestyle that I lead. <laughs> and um, I wanted people to see that there were all these other elements that went into having a healthy lifestyle. So, you know, that goes hand in hand with while we are gluten free, we might not be making the best decisions for physical activity and things like that. And um, that all of these things, these decisions were the building blocks of a complete healthy lifestyle. So um, I included some different exercise routines from low, actually a lot of local um, yoga practitioners and I'm certified in Pilates myself. I worked with another Pilates teacher and we put together some routines and um, Gave some tips on running because I come from a long distance back, um, background of running, and that was really important to me. And um, yeah, so it was just another element. I mean, about 75% of the book, I'd say, is recipes, but um, the, the healthy lifestyle as a whole was really important to me because I think that we get really hung up on the gluten free label. Um, and it was just another way of showing that it was more than just that. Yeah. So. What I like really about your book, too, is that you, you, People, like you said, think about lack and what you're missing. And because you have these big, beautiful photographs in there and the recipes are delicious, you know, it's really about joyful living. It's about fullness. It's about all the right. things that uh, really bring bring joy to life. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that was yeah. that was really important to me because I think that the first thing when people are diagnosed, um, a lot of people, um, is that they mourn the loss, you know, and I think that's perfectly okay and that you should. Um, cause you do have to say goodbye to a lot of different foods and even habits and things like that. Um, your family rituals will feel different. Going to out with friends will feel different, all of those <laughs> things. So I think morning the loss is okay. But then after that, you know, it's time to kind of pull up your girl, big girl panties and move on. And it's, it is, you know, um, there are still so many wonderful foods that you can eat. Um, and there are a lot of good things. So it's, 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 Part of that mental attitude is something I always teach people because I think it's really important to, instead of, like you said, focusing on the lack, to focus on all the things that we do still have. And that's not to say I don't still, you know, smell brush baked bread and, you know, wince a little, but uh, when you reap the benefits of it, it's a lot easier to turn the other way. Right. <laughs> it, it becomes a, almost a joke with my friends now when we go out, you know, it's. Uh, uh, I, I'm trying to figure out what's gluten free, and they're all trying to order my extra glutens. You know, that, right. that's my husband always teases me that yeah. because my yeah. husband does still eat gluten when we go out to eat and stuff. Our household's mostly gluten free. He'll every once in a while have a bagel or something like that, but he'll always, he loves to give me a hard time. And he'll say that I'll go through all the things with the server, and he'll go, "I'll take, I'll take her gluten, but all, all the gluten <laughs> she's not eating." You know, but uh, well, definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely a good sense of humor uh, helps. And uh, let's let's talk about the hidden side of gluten. I think this is really uh, interesting. So uh, one of the big problems with going gluten free is that they sneak those darn things in everywhere. Uh, you know, I was so annoyed when I found it in soy sauce. I mean, soy sauce. Uh, so let's talk about talk about what what are your top places that you know of that gluten's like to hide? Um. Well, one of the 
top ones that people don't think about, and I know I didn't think about it immediately whenever I had personal gluten free, is um, our personal care products, really? um, specifically um, toothpaste and mouthwash and things that we're using um, in the bathroom. Um, some people there's a, there's mixed views on shampoo and lotions and things like that. Although I use all gluten free products because my thing is always why not? There are plenty of options that are gluten-free, um, but specifically things like toothpaste and mouthwash that we just don't think about. You go to do it and you realize, you know, that this what? might be something that is is carrying gluten. Um, so that's that's one. Um, wait, wait, wait. Now, what does it say on the label? It doesn't say glutens or, or wheat on the label uh, toothpaste, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, no, the, I think that it's one of those situations that I just talked to somebody about this recently. Um, they like to fool you with, um, uh, you know, they have, I think, are 20 plus different names for gluten. I have the list on my website and okay. all the different things that they can call gluten. Um, so there's that. And then there's also things that they'll say caramel coloring or natural flavors. Natural and flavors. That. Um, and that's one, that's one point that I was going to make later was that that's a huge one that people see. Um, they're looking for that specific wheat, rye, barley, and it doesn't always look like that. And um, the... The, those additives, you know, the more the more ingredients that are in a product, the scarier it, it's definitely going to get for you. Um, yeah, so, blown yeah. away by shampoo. I mean, you know, that's crazy. But yeah, I didn't. Um, some people don't say they don't have reactions. I I actually do. I break out in really bad hives, and um, I actually had one really horrible experience with hair dye. Um, I moved back to Pittsburgh, and I went to a new hairdresser, and I didn't realize that. Um, I didn't think about it, and um, I put hair dry, hair dye. On that, within two hours, I came home and I experienced all of the same symptoms I would if I had ingested gluten or a lot of them. I had a horrible migraine. I had stomach cramping, and it didn't click until the next day that I this might be a problem. And I called, and there was wheat paste in it. And wow. you know, so some people will say I don't have that. I don't have that um, reaction, and that's totally you know your call. Um, but I definitely do. <laughs> so well, that, yeah, that kind of brings up the whole question of. Uh, you know, it's not an on or off switch, black or white. There's a whole spectrum of intolerance to glutens from just a little bit to, you know, apparently you have a pretty serious case. And that, that's part of why what we're going to get to next is so important, talking about the different symptoms it might be. But I, I definitely want to cover the rest of this list. So personal care, natural flavors, caramel color. Give us some other top, top yeah. ones. Um, the other one that I always tell people to look out for is their prescriptions, um, prescription medications or supplements. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, there is very often, um, specifically in prescription medications, um, gluten hiding out. It, it, it's very often in the encapsulation of something. Um, oh, the capsules. Yeah. Ones. Yeah. Um, again, it's one of those things that I think I know I do at least, I'm thinking why, <laughs> you know, but um, it is still something that the pharmaceutical industry isn't paying super close attention to. You'll now see um, some over-the-counter drugs that say gluten-free, like ibuprofen or things like that. Um, but definitely when you're, you know, going to the, to the pharmacist and, and if you have a prescription for whatever, you should ask the question because um, sure. it's it's one of those hidden hidden ones that you might not think about. Sure. Um, just seems like why would it be in there? Like you said, the soy sauce. <laughs> yeah, soy. Well, so uh, give us a couple. Is there a couple more that are really big ones in your book? Yeah, the other really top one that I I get a lot from people that um, I will say well, would a little bit just hurt is with spices, um, oh, yeah. specifically spice blends. Um, you know, the straight spices very often, um, like McCormick's brand, has a very good gluten free policy if it's there straight up. Spice specifically, if it's if it you know is just cinnamon or just parsley, it's going to be gluten free. Um, but with their blends, they warn you because um, they if you have a mixed chili powder blend or something like that, then they're not guaranteeing it's gluten free. Mm -hmm. um, I have had I've had clients actually one specifically who said I made this big pot of vegetarian chili and I got so sick and I couldn't figure it out and she sure enough looked at the back of her. Um, spice blend that she had used, and it said wheat right on the label. Um, and wow. it's not always that obvious. Again, it goes back to that. It'll say 
at the very end, natural flavorings or natural colorings, and that's where they, they can sneak in. But spices, yeah, it's a really big one. And and yes, every little bit does matter because um, slowly but surely you're just reigniting the inflammation process that you've worked really hard to heal. Um, so mm. spices, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Can we trust the if it says gluten-free on the label, can we trust it by and large? Uh, it's getting better. Um, the FDA just passed um, a labeling rule that um, anything that's gluten-free has to be 20 parts per million, less than 20 parts per million containing gluten. Um, that doesn't work for everybody. Um, some people say I react at five parts per million or, you know, um, everybody has, like, like we've already said, different reaction levels. Um, it's, it's, it's still a, you're still playing a little bit of Russian roulette with it. It's better. Um, you know, I'm really grateful for the improvement that they're acknowledging that it's something that they need to have stricter standards for. But I just saw an article last week with a food bar that was labeled gluten-free and I mean, right on the label, it said barley and somebody caught it, you know? Wow. Um, so we're still so learning. Still look, yeah. yeah. So really the best bet is, uh, only eat things without labels that, and if it's a blend, it's something you blended yourself. I guess. Yeah, right. and I would say go back to if you when in doubt, go back to one ingredient food item items. You can't go wrong with straight up chicken, straight up avocado, you know, produce, things like that. And of course we want to indulge in these different things. Um and that's okay. I think sometimes you can pick up the thing with a label, but it's really important to know um the company's standards, you know, before I try a new product, I always kind of do some research. Sometimes you have to pick up the phone and make a phone call if it's saying it's gluten free, you know, and you, you know, you are doubting it. It's really important to do your research. And I always say quite literally trust your gut in those situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, that if you, if you think it's questionable, it probably is. And um, that goes back to my days of being a reporter, my news editor would always say, if you're questioning to put that in the story, it's probably for a reason. <laughs> the same kind of goes with gluten. Okay. Um, because uh, if I'm questioning it, I'm probably not putting it in my mouth. You know, it's just not something that I'm going to even risk that it's going to upset my digestive system. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, good advice there. So let's talk about the, the hidden symptoms. You know, like we talked about, there's a wide range of reactions from minor to very severe so what are the kinds of things, like what I noticed uh, from hearing you talk a couple of weeks ago when we were at, uh, when I met you at Dan Wagner's open house is uh, migraine headaches could be a gluten thing. Yeah, um, for me specifically, it was everything from um, migraines, um, like you said, to joint pain. I would wake up in the morning and I mean, at the time before I was diagnosed, I was 26 years old and it hurt to get out of bed and I thought this is not, this can't be normal. Um, to what you hear a lot of, which is the digestive pain, um, really horrible bathroom experiences from leading um, to diarrhea or even um, sometimes vomiting, um, things like that. Um, the cramping, people say, I feel like my belly expands, you know, I feel like I'm pregnant because they're feeling the really harsh bloat that a lot of people who, you know, prior to stopping um, eating gluten would, would be really familiar with. Um, it, it's a really uncomfortable feeling. And for me, I didn't actually um, lose weight specifically whenever I went gluten-free, but that was one of the huge ones is that every time I ate, I felt like my stomach was busting out of my pants because it was really painful. Um, and I didn't, I didn't at the time know why. So those are obviously some of the, the more common ones. Yeah. Um, and then I, I have everything from, um, oh, that's another one for me, mental fogginess. Mental I was fogginess. Yeah, I would be at work and I would feel like I was, you know, it was 9.30 in the morning and I was already ready to go to bed. I couldn't focus on what was in front of me. Um, it was it was pretty bad, the fatigue and, and the inability to focus. Um, and that goes as far as I've heard people say, that they found improvements with people who have dementia um, or Alzheimer's by going on a gluten-free diet. And um, there's still a lot of studies out about that. But um, one specific one that was really important to me was um, on a recent study, and I cannot remember the amount of cadavers, but it was a very large group of cadavers. And they um, all had passed away from Alzheimer's disease. And within that, within that group, 75% of them had celiac disease. Um, it was pretty crazy. Um, so, you know, we're still looking for those kinds of links, but, um, that 
that's just one of them. Um, people who have had rheumatoid arthritis, regular just arthritis, um, have seen improvements. My sister has alopecia areata, which is another autoimmune condition, mm. a hair loss disorder. Um, she went gluten free, and her hair started growing back. Wow. Um, so there, I've had people just say, "I feel better." You know, I have more energy. I, um, I did lose weight because they stopped, you know, focusing maybe so hard on the packaged products, like we said, and you know, went back to a little more, you know, closer to eating the one ingredient food items. Um, so yeah, it's any. I've heard everything from different people, you know, and then, like I said myself, from migraines to joint pain, exhaustion. Sure. Um, the, the, the obvious the, digestive upset and so forth. Yeah, the GI ones you think would be the most obvious, and then the physical things. Yeah. And then mental is kind of interesting, but for myself, I, I found uh, a lot, uh, almost all of my anxiety, all my nervousness, and much yeah. of my depression was completely gone. Yeah, that was another really big one for me. I'm glad you said that. Because yeah. that sometimes I don't remember to mention that. And that was a big one for me, too, um, that I had when I was at my peak of really feeling the effects of dealing with this disease that I didn't know I had, I always led a really active lifestyle and had a lot of energy. And I just got to a point where it just, you know, a lot of those things weren't um, innately interesting to me anymore. I just didn't feel a want to do them. And I just kind of got into a slump, you know? Um, and that's a big one that I've heard from people a lot, anxiety, depression, um, for sure. And even, um, like we already talked about the, the skin reactions. My brother also was diagnosed with celiac disease after I was, and he had horrible, horrible eczema um, that completely healed itself once he went gluten-free. So it sounds like a cure-all. I don't know if that's the case, but I do know that a lot of people have found. Well, and it's interesting, too, because so many doctors don't seem to recognize it at first or don't want to acknowledge it, or they put people through tests, and the tests say, oh, no, you don't have celiac disease. But still, right. you look at them and you can tell they just look bloated. They look like Bloaty, the eighth dwarf, right. you know. And, right. and, you know, really the best way is, uh, tell me if this is true, that the best way to test for your, you know, reaction to glutens is to stop eating them for 30 days, the elimination diet. And then on the 31st day, you know, have a bagel and a beer or something and see what the reaction is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always say to people, they, you know, I, I did go for the test and I did get the answer that I was seeking for so long because prior to that I had gone through so much testing trying to figure out what I what was wrong with me and that was the last thing that actually um, I was I kept saying I mean this started when I was 19 years old I feel like it's something I'm eating and they tested me for everything from diabetes to lupus to rheumatoid arthritis I had a bone marrow biopsy because they thought I had leukemia because my white blood cell count was so out of control. Jeez. Um, so, you know, if you do go and you don't, and, and I eventually had to push for that test because I think it's really important to be your own, your own health advocate. Yeah. Um, but, and so I did get that answer, but not everybody does. And they, you know, will come to me and say, I really think this is a problem. And exactly like you said, I say, well, then stop eating it, you know, and um, <laughs> it's not, it's definitely not going to hurt you um, to stop eating it and you won't be missing any important nutrients or anything like that. Um, so stop eating it and yeah, just, just do that elimination diet and then right. try to see what happens. And if you're pretty miserable, then you're probably right. You know, it probably is something that you shouldn't be ingesting. And then so. you get into this conversation with people where they say, well, I can't live without my bread or a beer or whatever it is. And you say, well, then you have to decide, you know, which is worse, you know, the misery uh, every morning when you're sitting on the throne or, uh, right. you know, the, the lack of beer or, or bread or bagels or whatever it is, you know. Right. Which, yeah, it becomes a quality of life issue, right. you know, where you have to start deciding, you know, how you want to wake up and feel every day. And I know, like, like I have said already, for me, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. It was just, um, I had you know, spent the majority of my 20s feeling pretty crappy. And uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't, there was no amount of sadness over donuts that would have caused me to, <laughs> to once I had the answer, I never looked back. And I, I have not missed the bagels answer. either. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, and I, I never push anybody into it. I think that everybody needs their process. Um, but it's, you know, it, it really can be life changing for some people. And, um, it's, you know, it's important in those moments to really, like you said, consider 
consider your options and what your life looks like from here on out. And the truth is that if you do have a serious issue with it, if you do have celiac disease or a very severe gluten intolerance or even a mild one for all I know, um, you're going to see other issues down the road if you continue to do it. It's, it's not something that you know, you want to mess around with, um, you know, people can develop diabetes, they can get colon cancer from all the damage they've done to their intestines, um, and so forth. It's not, uh, it doesn't, you know, while the, while the, the, like you said, bagels and donuts might be good now, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a pretty outlook for their future. Yeah, so. I, I definitely noticed that it seemed to, with age, the, the symptoms seem to get worse, but yeah. now let's talk about the positive side, Doug. there's the hidden, yeah. the hidden cures, the things that, uh, you know, I've been gluten free for about two years now, and um, there are still days I wake up and I and I'm walking around saying, "Oh, yeah, that doesn't hurt anymore." You know, or, yeah. or this seems to be okay now. Or boy, I used to limp here or have trouble going up the steps, and now that's gone now. So there's all these hidden cures, basically. Talk about any of those that you want to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I had somebody actually exactly what you just said. One of my clients said, "I was driving a month after being gluten free. I was driving to work, and I realized I." didn't think I wasn't thinking about my stomach and it was so revolutionary for her and for some people that might sound crazy but when you do think about your digestive tract as much as you do when you're feeling like that it's quite amazing to just not be considering it anymore to not feel that heavy cramped you know whatever it is feeling um it's awesome so yeah. um that's a that's a huge thing like I said um my energy levels improved Tens, tenfold. Um, I was suffering from horrible skin reactions, everything from um, psoriasis to really bad adult acne um, because my body wasn't getting the nutrients I needed. So um, that improved. Um, so my energy, acne, yeah. um, the migraines was a huge one for me. Um, I was having migraines anywhere from five to six times straight days um, at a time throughout the week. It was quite literally mind numbing. I, yeah. I thought that I would never, ever escape feeling that much pain. Um, so now I'm, I'm down to just a few every once in a while when I'm feeling hormonal or if I, you know, decide to have two glasses of wine right before bed or something like that. Um, you know, then I, I might feel it the next morning, but, um, I, that was for me, I probably one of my, other than my, of course, no longer feeling the digestive pain that I had been migraines was next on my list because it was so, um, it had just, it taken, it took away so many of my days of just being in pain and having to, um, be in a dark room and lay down with ice and, you know, things like that. So, um, that was, that was really life changing for me. Um, and then just, I think, you know, just your overall quality of life is as much as, like I said, you can focus on the things that you don't you can't eat. Um, it's there are so many beautiful things that you still can eat, and some people Absolutely. gain a huge appreciation, a new uh, appreciation for food. And um, it for me, I know I had always been someone who liked being in the kitchen, but it really, really inspired me, obviously, <laughs> to be in the kitchen and to learn how to do new things. And um, it's it can be that can also be a really cool thing you experience and learn about new foods and how to make them interesting. Um, so outside of even just the physical improvements that you will in fact feel, um, it, that was really, a, that was a cool thing for me too. It was just learning about new kinds of food and that there's still a lot of things that I could eat. <laughs> well, I think that's the good news is, you know, I was a foodie before I went gluten free and I found that really focusing on the raw foods and the uh, healthy foods, I've become even more of a foodie and right. it, the, some of them are so easy to make. It's actually fun to be in the kitchen and make some of these things. That's what I always say that I'm such a foodie. I mean, it's literally I book travel, and the next thing I do is find the restaurant. Find the restaurant. <laughs> so, and people always say, how can you be gluten free and be a foodie? And I mean, I really truly think you can. And there's I, so many amazing things you can eat. <laughs> yeah, I think actually the more the more gluten free you are, the more of a foodie you become. I would yeah, say. I mean, I've experienced now even more, like, even in terms of like ethnic food and things like that, and just uh, exploring different flavors, and I just things that I hadn't really considered before. Um, I've gone to amazing, amazing restaurants that have accommodated, you know, my gluten-free diet and things like that. Um, and yeah, so I don't, I think you can definitely be a gluten-free foodie. Yeah. I know you can. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, speaking of things you can try, uh, May 10th, you'll be at Sunny Bridge where you'll be having a smoothie tasting and yeah. people can meet you and get signed copies of your book. 
Uh, tell us what uh, the times and the details and what kind of smoothies you're going to be serving up. So I'll be um, at Sunnybridge this Saturday, May 10th, from 2 to 4 p.m. And um, we actually, we're picking a smoothie from the book. We're between the orange carrot ginger sunrise and um, a beet, an apple beet smoothie. Um, they're both really bright and beautiful. So, um, and they're also going to be serving up some of the ones that they have in-house. And Sunnybridge is so cool because they actually have an all gluten-free cafe, which is, for me, and I'm sure for a lot of people, you're so used to walking into somewhere and having to you know, tell somebody about your gluten-free needs. It's so nice to kind of just kick back and have somebody take care of it for you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I still ask every time I go in there, I still ask, are you sure this is gluten-free? I know, I know. I'm like, so, and everything's gluten-free. You know, you have to <laughs> just don't it, it, so used to it. But <laughs> I, I have to agree with you. I think their cafe is the best gluten-free food I've found in the city so far. It's amazing. I just, yeah. last time I was there, I had one of their wraps, and I was like, just, yeah. it's just nice to be able to eat something that, you know, you know is not going to hurt you. <laughs> well, now, I will say, um, they have the widest variety and the, and the best food. Uh, if you haven't tried uh, Jason's, uh, um, um, oh, shoot, now I forgot his name, um, at the Schwartz Market. Uh, there's a there's a guy that makes food there. I I want to say Jason, but I don't think that's right. Um, he makes just great food there. Um, uh, the Schwartz Market on the south side, and oh, okay. uh, there's a whole bunch of new places that are opening up. Uh, but we that's a whole other show we can talk about there. Oh yeah, I know. I've, I'm so excited. <laughs> but anyway, um, I want to thank you, Caroline. It's a great book, and uh, I know people look forward to seeing you on May 10th. And I really appreciate appreciate you being with us uh, on our show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. You bet. Thanks. And that will do it for today. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Thanks to Mike Sorg, living in the future with his Google Glass. Um, next week, we will have Ola from Ola's Herbs in Squirrel Hill. We'll be talking about herbs that you should be planting uh, now, soon. This is May. It's springtime. Uh, we're pretty sure it's holding. Uh, no more snow. Uh, so you want to tune into that. Thanks again to Greg Nicosia and to Caroline Shannon Karasik. Look for us on Facebook. You'll be seeing more uh, videos and photos from the conference um, at the uh, Journal of Lifestyle Medicine Facebook page and also on the web. And we'll see you again next time. And let's get together and stay connected out there. Thanks. We'll see you.